In this world of health consciousness, we seem to focus a lot on diet and exercise. But did you know there's an area in our lives that can cause greater damage than neglecting both of these? It's unforgiveness. Pastor Terry will teach us how to overcome this cancer as he continues in our current series, Eight Words to Change Your Family. Today's sermon is entitled, Forgiveness. Let's listen to hear what Terry has to say about this subject. Hey, I have a question for you, real quick. Actually, it's not a question, it's actually a statement. Let me put it to you this way. We're talking about eight words to change your family. Eight words to change your family. And I want to start with this statement. No one does family perfectly. No one does family perfectly. We wish we could. We enjoy it. We like watching. For instance, you look at some of the TV shows. Remember the TV shows? I was going over some of these shows with Chad this morning. He goes, boy, you're really showing your age, Terry. I go, oh, okay, all right. But some of the shows that were good, that made you feel good about family. Remember the Waltons? Okay, I remember growing up on the Waltons. Uh, uh, name someone that you guys like, Little House on a Prairie. I couldn't stand it. That was just too sappy for me. But some of those, <laughs> but it still was a good family shows, things that you enjoyed, that you liked, that just made you feel good about it. Remember Leave It to Beaver? Maybe? Okay, all right. Yeah. That was on the rerun channel. Actually, that's how I saw that one. <laughs> but, but Gilligan's Island? Yeah, but that was, <laughs> this really wasn't a family though, but, but they were a family. But the thing is this, instead, we see shows today that highlight really dysfunctional families. And I remember one of the first ones that came out, and I'm not here to bash those, but I do remember thinking, wow, look at look what we're promoting now. Uh, Roseanne, how many guys remember that? I go, my goodness, what a family. Thank, I just held on to my mom and dad saying, Lord, protect me from that. You know, that sort of stuff. Uh, the family, uh, other things, married with children, you know. And to top it off, we have shows like the Jerry Springer show. How many guys remember that thing? That was human debris paraded right before you on TV. But it was all families. And we've, we promoted that. And we looked at it and said, this is normal, everyone. You know, that's what the normal that God wants for families. That's not what God created families for. Amen? He did not create us to live family life that way. That was very dysfunctional. It was very hurting, very hard. Let me give you some signs that your family life is stressful. If, if any of these three apply to you, it means your family life is stressful. Number one, your family get-togethers are sometimes called group therapy sessions and involve seeing a psychiatrist. If that's you, then you have family stress issues, uh, family life issues as well. How about this one? Conversations often begin with, put the gun down, then we'll talk, okay? <laughs> if that's you, then you have a very stressful family life. You also know that you have a very stressful family life if any of your animals are on uh, Valium. Okay, these are things that we, the world looks, we look at the family today. It's under attack like no other thing on, in the world. The devil knows that number one, God wants to establish his kingdom here on earth. He wants to establish holy living and he wants to do it through the family. You hear me? He really wants to do it through us, the family. Every family he wants to do it through. But the devil says, you know what, I'm going to attack that. I'm going to cause divorce rates to just go skyrocket. So people don't know what it's like to have a mom and dad. Or they have an extended family all over the place. I'm not here to knock down. If you've been part of that, I'm not here to put you down by any means. I'm just telling you, it's not the heart of God. The heart of God goes out to those who are hurting, to those who are struggling. It goes out to those who've been under stress, who've been under attack, who are ashamed, embarrassed, fighting resentment, you name it. God's heart goes out to the family that's broken today. I want you to know that. And there's hope. Chad gave us the word hope, the first word that we had there two weeks ago. There is hope for the family to those who trust God and admit, I need help. Amen? There's hope for those who know that they need help. And God says, I want to give hope to the family more than anything else. That's the reason why Faith Outreach Center has one of its core values is family and community. And I just want to bring this up right here real quick to show you. Go ahead and go to the slide, if you would, please. This is the core values, one of the core values of Faith Outreach Center. I just want to read it to you. We value building up strong marriages and families. We do. Where God's word is taught and lived out. Where husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church. And where wives respect their husbands. Where the hearts of the parents are turned towards their children. And the hearts of the children turn towards their parents. That is what we are about. That's what God is about. And that's what we should always be about. 
God wants to restore your family. So if you grew up, or maybe you're outside of the family right now, but it doesn't matter. God wants to restore any relationship that's in the family that's here today, that's struggling, that's hurt, that's broken, that knows pain and resentment and anger more than it remembers all the joyful times. That's the family God wants to touch today, and that's what he values very much. Hallelujah. God commands, and one of, the, one of the things, the answers to this, the answer is, how do I get my family healed again? Can I tell you what the answer is? And this is our word we're talking about today, and it's called forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, you, you may, some of you may be saying, Pastor Terry, you've talked about forgiveness twice now within the last two months. I know. I know. I, and this will be the third time. And for some reason, I, I was asking my wife, I was asking my staff, I, what's God doing here? What's God want to speak? Is there really that dysfunctional or is it really that hurtful out there right now that people need to hear this again and again you know or is it is it god talking to pastor terry terry i'm talking to you over this you know the word of god applies to every one of us when i preach this can i tell you this when i preach this i'm not just looking at you and saying this is for you i'm preaching this because i'm i've looked at myself and i've cried over it or i've hurt over it i struggled over it i got mad over it god really looked at me first on a whole bunch of this stuff so this is for everyone underneath my voice today. God wants to heal families, and he wants to do it through forgiveness. That is one of the greatest ways to heal families through forgiveness today. God created the family. He knows how the family works. Today we look at TV, and we look at some of these shows, and they, they try to redefine what a family is and what it should be. You know, the, what we ought to do is go back to the original blueprint and find out what God says the family should be because he is the creator of the family, not government, not society. God is the creator of the family. And so let me read this to you. It's found in Mark eleven twenty five, 25. And this has to do with forgiveness. And God says, if you want to have a family that works, then you also need to operate in forgiveness in your life. Amen? And this is the scripture, this part of it. Mark eleven twenty five. But when you are praying... First, forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins also. See, Jesus is teaching. It's so important to him. He's constantly teaching about forgiveness. And one of the things he says here is, it says, first, forgive anyone. Forgive them if you are holding a grudge. I thought, everyone knows what the word grudge is. I think I'm going to look up the word grudge. And the grudge means a persistent feeling of ill will or resentment resulting from a past injury or insult. There's a lot of people today who are hurting because something happened in their life, and so they hold a grudge. And when they hold a grudge, it increases ill feeling. How many of you guys like to be mad at someone all the time? I, you know, when you have kids and the kids are growing up, how, how do you guys uh, hate it when you're just constantly, the kids made you angry all the time? It's like, you guys are ruining my day. Stop it, because I'm angry at you all the time. It's your fault. Knock it off. They're looking at you. They're, you're a whack out mom and dad. <laughs> But it is. When you're angry at someone all the time, it just ruins your day. It ruins your life. Amen. God says, I want to heal that thing in your life. But you've got to forgive. You've got to give up the grudge that you're holding against them. There's another one found in Luke 6, 37. It says this, forgive others and you will be forgiven. Jesus is teaching. Jesus teaches also in Matthew 6, 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Did you know that when you hurt someone, in which I'm going to get into the definition what it is, but you actually owe someone something. Let's read this. Where would you be right now if God chose to forgive you as much as you've forgiven those in your family right now? That's exactly what the scripture is saying. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So if you want to be forgiven, we have to be forgivers. It's very, very important. I forgive, but we're going to talk a little bit about that. If you want to be forgiven, you have to be a forgiver. That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is all about forgiveness, and that's what God wants to pour out on his church and for us and the family as well. So what is forgiveness? Let's just answer that question real quick. I'm going to put it up here. Forgiveness is a decision. Say that word with me, church. One, two, three. A decision. Forgiveness is a decision to release a person from the obligation that resulted when they hurt you. Let me give you an example of something like that. Suppose, uh, suppose I came up and I kicked your cat. Ah, you guys don't care if I did that anyway, so there's no need for forgiveness there. How about, how about if uh, I went up to my wife, and out of spite, and out of anger, and just to be mean, because whatever it was at that moment, I just took my drink, and I just threw it in my wife's face. This is hypothetical. It's never happened. I would not be living. I would not be standing up here. 
But suppose I did that. I did something wrong. I knew it was wrong. I did something hurtful. And I did it to my wife who's done nothing wrong at all. Now I have an obligation to her. I'm indebted to her. I owe her something, so to speak, don't I? I have an obligation right there. Jenny now has two choices. My wife has two choices. Number one, become bitter. And when she becomes bitter, she suffers through all that stuff for the wrong that I have done to her. So the first choice is become bitter and then suffer because of that bitterness. Or the second thing is to release me from that obligation that I owe her for what I did to her. She can release me. Now that does two things. That releases me, but it also releases her. When we forgive, it does two things. It releases those that have harmed us, but it also releases us that we're going to find out again real quickly. What happens when a family doesn't forgive? Well, I want you to know this. God is happy when his children are living in harmony. So that's why Jesus taught on the subject. Um, I want to go over the scripture. We went over the scripture before, but it's a long one. But bear with me, okay? We're going to take it apart a little segment by segment. And it starts here in um, Matthew 18, 21. And this is Peter. See, Peter's been listening to Jesus talking about life and talking about families, talking about forgiveness. And so Peter, hearing all this stuff, he asks Jesus a question. And Peter, when he asks this question, he's thinking, hey, man, I'm a forgiveness machine. Jesus is going to be impressed by what I'm going to ask him right now. So Peter asks him this, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who's sinned against me? Seven times? So he's feeling pretty proud because back then the Pharisees taught you only had to forgive them three times. And that's pretty good. They thought that was pretty good. But so what did Peter here think? Well, I'm just going to go more than twice that. I'm going to go seven and see what Jesus thinks of me. But here's what Jesus says. No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Is Jesus telling us to keep a scorecard up on our refrigerator every single time uh, someone messes with us or sins against us and makes us angry or hurts us? We are to keep score until it gets up to a certain point, then we stop forgiving them? No. What he's doing this here, he's saying, look, it's such a high number that you're to forgive freely. You're not to keep score. You're not to keep a tally on what's going on in your life as, as far as the hurts is concerned. Don't do that. Don't do that. Forgive freely. Jesus continues with the story. He goes, now I'm going to give you an example. Now, this is a story that he, it's not a true story, but Jesus tells it here to make his point. And this is found in Matthew, the next chapter, 18, 23. It says this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. See, at the time, his servants owed the king a lot of money. So he says, all right, it's time to cash in. It's time for my servants to pay me what they owe me. So he gathers them up and he says, and when he had begun to settle the accounts, one servant was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. I looked up how much 10,000 talents is today. There's a various different ways of calculating it, and they're all varying quite a bit. But the one I saw was this. It says 10,000 talents is the, thing, it's the same thing as 150,000 years worth of pay. 150,000 years worth of pay. You know what that adds up to? Over uh, $6.5 trillion. You know, it's catching up with our national debt. You know, and that's, that's pretty hard to do that. But the point is this. There's no way this guy could even hope to pay this back. $6.5 trillion. What king would allow <laughs> anyone to own that much anyway? But anyway, verse 25. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that they had and that payment be made. And the servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. There's just no way this guy could pay it all. The king is actually saying, you know what? Let's... Uh, Let's put him in prison, let's sell all of his family, sell all of his goods and cut our losses and just get on with this. But then all of a sudden we have this servant getting down on his knees begging, please give me a chance to pay back. He's even going to try and pay it back. There's no way he could pay this back, church. He can't live 150,000 years. There's no way. So it's a debt that he could not pay. Verse 27, then the master of the servant was moved with compassion and released him. And forgave him the debt. Verse 28. But that servant went out. The same servant who was just forgiven. Six and a half trillion dollars. Something he could never, ever even hope to pay. Verse 28. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants. A friend. Owed him a hundred denarii. I think that's how you pronounce it. But a hundred denarii is equal to about a hundred days worth of pay. In other words, a very large, um, what do you want to call it? When you, a bonus check. You know what I'm saying? That is... He just went after him. What does he do here? 
Verse, and he said, laid hands on him, and he took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down on his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Look at this. He grabbed the guy by the throat who owed him just a, such a small amount compared to what he had. And what is, how does he respond? Verse 30. And when he would not, he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. He took this guy, threw him into prison, which is a crazy thing. How is he going to get his money from the guy when he's in prison? He ain't going to get it. He's never going to get the money back. And so when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told the master all that had been done. Then the master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was, bit, was angry, and he delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. And verse 35 so my, he so my heavenly Father will also do to you, each of you, from his heart. This, I'm sorry, let me read it again. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you, from his heart, does not forgive his brother's trespasses. See, when Peter was asking, Lord, how many times must I forgive? He wasn't looking for a spot. What he was doing is, Lord, when is it that I don't have to forgive? When is it that I can stop forgiving? I mean, is it seven times? I mean, this, this thing where you say forgive all the time, that's just a little too much. That's just a little crazy. How about, how about when he goes overboard here? How about when he does this or that? And Jesus says, no, you got to forgive him all. you got to forgive him all. Right now, I believe in my heart, there's some that are sitting here today who've been treated very bad. Uh, someone owes you immensely for the pain and the hurt and whatever it is that's happened in your life. Please don't turn me out. Please don't turn the Holy Spirit out. There, there's release for you. There's hope for you. And it's not one of these things that we just flippantly go out and we just forgive people like that. God has a pattern that he wants to do to bless us. He has a pattern in our life he wants to do to heal us and to heal our families. So please pay attention. Even with this hurt, you're thinking, I'm not listening to this. This is crazy because you don't know, Pastor Terry, what happened to me. You don't know what my parents did. You don't know what my spouse did. You don't know what my children did. You have no idea. Yeah, you're right. I don't. I don't. But from what I'm reading here, it doesn't matter how big the debt that's owed to you, we're to forgive it. And God's going to teach us how we can do it. And Peter has the same thoughts that you may be having right now. And he says, you have no idea. Do I have to forgive it up to this amount? Because he's looking for an excuse. When can he stop forgiving? And here's what we find out. See, it's easy when I look at you or you look at me and you say, you know what? That was a very petty thing, Terry. You ought to forgive. But then when it comes to us, all of a sudden we say, uh, well, you don't understand. This was done to me. Let me give you five excuses that many of us have tried in order not to forgive someone. The first excuse goes something like this. The hurt is too big. You have no idea the pain I went through. The hurt is just tremendous. It's just too big. I can't forgive. Well, this kind of sounds crazy. You can't forgive a big hurt? I mean, it seems to me like that huge burden, that big hurt on you, you would want to get rid of. You want to get rid of it. You don't want to think about it all the time. You don't want to dwell on it. You don't want it to just suffocate your feelings and your emotions and your thoughts all the time. And every time you come around them, it just, it just, your stress level just goes way up and your anxiety level goes way up. Man, you want to get rid of those big things. I mean, I can see the little things maybe, but, you know, get rid of the big things. Get rid of that burden on your life. That excuse is crazy. Get rid of it. The second one may be this. Well, I'll just forget it. I'm not going to forgive him because time is going to heal it. Time will heal all wounds. You know what, news? Um, time, does, time does not heal anything. The only thing that time does when people don't forgive, listen to this, it creates scars. And if you want to know if you've actually forgiven someone over a period of time, let them just touch you in that area of your life where you thought you, you know, you thought, yeah, I just forget about it. But when they touch it later on in life, it's still very painful and you become very angry and it affects you physically in every way. Amen? So time does not heal it. You were to forgive it. The third reason why we don't forgive. Well, I'll forgive when they come and say they are sorry. This is my favorite one. <laughs> when they come and say they're sorry, then I'm going to forgive them. Well, newsflash. They're not, coming to say, they're not coming to apologize to you. More than likely, they will not come to apologize to you. So if you live your life that way, you will never, ever forgive anyone because they won't be coming to you. 
How about this one? I can't forgive. And that, Angie actually brought this one up. I can't forgive it because I can't forget. Last Sunday, we actually had a, a family here, and I, I talked to them afterwards, and that was the biggest thing. I mean, this, this family was hurting so bad. I mean, so bad. I kept thinking, oh, my word. I don't know what to say to this. But the whole thing just kept coming up. I've forgiven, but I will not forget. I've forgiven, but I will not forget. I'm thinking, whoa, you have not forgiven. Did you know that you can't forget until you've forgiven? So when people say, I cannot forgive until I forgive, you know, I, I can forgive, but I can't forget. You know, you cannot forgive because you have to forget, then it will be forgiven. Let's read on. Number five, if I forgive, they will just do it again. How many of you guys have ever thought that one? If I forgive my family members, they'll just do it again. You know what? This is so true, especially in family, because we're constantly bumping into each other. We, we live underneath the same roof or whatever. You guys are in relation with each other very close all the time. More than likely, they will do it again. So remember this. Unforgiveness is a burden on us. When someone has done something to us, they hurt us, and we don't forgive them, that's a burden on us. So why would you want to hold on to this? Because you say they're going to do it again, and all of a sudden they do do it again. Now you have two heavy burdens on top of you. And then you don't forgive them. Then you have a third heavy burden. on. Now you're carrying all these things, and it will destroy your life, not only emotionally, but physically as well and spiritually. It will destroy you and eat away at you. So when these five excuses that we have here... Let's just knock them out of the water. None of these excuses are valid. None of these excuses are, will hold up in water. They just will sink. They will sink you as well. So don't live by these excuses when you have someone that's hurt you. Let's find out how to forgive them. What's the effects of unforgiveness in our lives? Let's go to a blank slide here. What are the effects? First of all, I want to read this to you from the healthnewsdigest.com. And I found this and I thought it was so good. And I did not know. Did you know that there's colleges that actually study forgiveness? as part of their degree or part of their research. I had no idea. From, doc, from the healthnewsdigest.com, it says this. Dr. Michael Berry spent years studying the disease of unforgiveness or holding on to negative feelings and emotions such as hatred, anger, and bitterness. These feelings and emotional sense, uh, stressors can impact every organ of our bodies. Did you know that? When we choose to not forgive, it impacts every organ of our body. Matter of fact, it's just so interesting. On the way into church today, I was listening to, I just turned on the radio, and I listened to talk radio, and it was this guy talking about resentment and talking about unforgiveness. I, I believe it or not. And he says it not only affects everything in the body, but it also affects acne, people's skin, because that is an organ. I had no idea. Those who are bittered, those who are hurt and they hold on to it and harbor it and just keep it and says, leave it alone, this is my hurt, it affects them. And it affects even the acne. <laughs> it's amazing. The Forgiveness Project, the startling discovery of how to overcome cancer, find health, and achieve peace, Barry writes about his research into how unforgiveness is a disease and an emotional disorder. When families refuse to forgive, it will destroy their bodies. It will destroy who they are. God, do you see why God does not want us to hold on to unforgiveness? Amen? He loves us too much, as Angie said. He loves us too much, and he wants to bring healing into our lives. When families refuse to forgive, you know what they're trying to do? When you refuse to forgive, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get even. You're trying to hurt them. Yeah, that's something that uh, we always say, hurt people, hurt people. When someone is hurt, what do they do? They always hurt someone else. So when people have unforgiveness in their lives and they have hurt, they will constantly hurt someone else, in their families especially. We are most brutal to our families, I think, more than anybody else. And that's why God wants to heal us of those things. I mean, um, you know what? All those things I just read to you there about how it affects your body. Number one, it talked about cancer. It talked about all these other various things. It affects all the organs. And I'm not going to go into great detail. But we do know and they've proven that it does affect our body tremendously. Tremendously. And that's why in that one scripture, Matthew 18, 34, it says this. And his master was angry. And he delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. Remember that story? I just got through reading he would not forgive his fellow servant the money, so he threw him into prison. And when the king found out about it, he says, you know what, that's, that's it. I'm going to turn you over to the torturers. You know what the torturers are in our lives when we refuse to forgive people? The torturers in our lives is the diseases that come upon our bodies and on our minds and our emotions when we do that. That's the torture. 
So when we refuse to forgive people, when we refuse to forgive them their debt, what they owe us, they have an obligation to us because they hurt us, and we refuse to forget that and we hold on to it, the torture has come into our bodies, and it's affecting every organ in our body. It's affecting our mind. It's affecting our spiritual life and our walk with God and our relationships with our family and everyone else. That is the torture the Scripture is talking about there. It's not like all of a sudden God just wants to send this angel of torturing. No, that's something that is set up. When we refuse to do anything, the torture is with inside of us because of us holding on to that grudge because we think we owe it. This is the torture. The world's worst prison is an unforgiving heart. So when we refuse to forgive people, we are not only putting them in prison, but it throws us into prison with a torture in our lives. So... What are the benefits of forgiveness? Well, they're huge. They're huge. We, just, we saw some of the physical things. The act of forgiving affects the body and the mind. Uh, these are some of the things I put down. Facial expressions and body posture even changes, scientists have shown. I'm, I'm giving it to you from the science. But word of God stands true. It doesn't need science. Word of God stands true. Science proves the word of God. Amen? Science is not against. I'm going to say this again because you heard me say it. Science and the Bible are not at odds. Science proves the Bible again and again and again and again. It's bad science where they say there's no God, so therefore we came from pond scum. That's when science and Bible do not collaborate. But God and science are not at odds with each other. And one of the science has found that when we forgive, these are the benefits of forgiving. The act of forgiveness affects the body and the mind. Facial expressions, body postures change. Hostility is reduced, resulting in fewer uh, cardiovascular problems, fewer heart attacks, less stress. Your immune system is stronger. When you don't forgive, the very first thing that goes in your life, listen to this, is your immune system. Fewer mental and emotional disorders and problems, all through the power of forgiveness. All through the power of forgiveness. Listen to what one scientist who studied that said this. His name is uh, Fred Luskins, and he's the director of the Stanford University of Pro uh, Forgiveness Projects. Here's what he said. Who would have thunk it that something locked away in religious culture could be turned into a secular training program? <laughs> Who would have thunk it? We as Christians would have thunk that. Amen? We serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who created the bodies and who created the family. And he knows what's good for us. So when God says no, he's not saying no just to say no. He's saying no because I don't want this to be attached to you. I don't want this thing to be on you. I don't want you harboring. When he says don't, he's saying don't harbor unforgiveness. Why? So that your life will be good. Amen? When we harbor unforgiveness, our life is destroyed. So when God says don't harbor unforgiveness... He says, forgive, that's what he's saying. And when we refuse to obey God, what we're saying is we're sinning. And we're saying, Lord, I, I don't care what you're saying. We choose the sin. And when we choose the sin, we're choosing the consequences of sin in our own life. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. So when God says, forgive, you know what he's saying to you, actually? Do yourself a favor. <laughs> forgive. Get rid of the torture that's in your heart, in your life. Get rid of it. Forgive. I'm for you, not against you. Amen? Your God is for you. So how do families forgive? Well, it comes in two parts. This is the part that we all need to listen to. Number one, it begins, and we started it with before, it begins with a decision, an act of our will. I choose to forgive. I choose to no longer hold you uh, uh, guilty in this area. I choose to no longer hold you obligated to owing me. I forgive you. And actually, we call that the crisis of forgiveness. It's the turning point. You know, when I looked at... Uh, when the author talked about the crisis of forgiveness, I looked up the word crisis. I thought, I'm one of these guys who looks up uh, every simple little word. But it's interesting because it says this. It's the turning point of the disease. It's a turning point of the disease. Important change takes place. A crisis. So if you want the, a crisis of forgiveness, what that does, that's the turning point of the disease of unforgiveness in our lives that affects our body. So, number one, it begins with the decision and act of the will. I choose to forgive i make a choice to release a person from the obligation that resulted when they injured me i make a choice now this listen your emotions may say otherwise your anger and the hurt may say otherwise but you know what do christians live by their emotions only no we live by the word of god which is true forever and ever and will never change 
So when the word of God says to do this, we say, yes, Lord. My emotions don't feel it, but you know what? I don't listen to my emotions. Shut up, emotions. I'm going to obey the word of God, and I choose to forgive you. You know, forget it. You, don't, you owe me nothing. You owe me nothing. Amen? That is the very first thing. And the next thing, the next point is this. I make a choice to release a person from the obligation, but the, uh, I'm no longer looking for revenge. I'm no longer wishing bad things for you. I'm not focused on them all the time, and I release them from all obligations. I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. Now, the second thing is the process of forgiveness. This is the part here that, where we put motion to it. In the process of forgiveness, we say, I will treat you as though it never happened. I will treat you as though it never happened. Here's how it works. I will never bring up the offense that you just did to me. I will never bring up the offense to the person that hurt me. That's number one. Number two, I'll never bring up the offense to other people around. Have you ever guys noticed when someone's done you wrong, what's the first thing we do? We go and tell someone else what they've done to us, and we talk about it to this person, and then we go and talk about it to this person, and then we go and talk about it to that person. So the process of forgiveness is this. Number one, I will never bring it up to you again. It's forgotten. It's forgiven. It's forgiven. Number two, I won't bring it up to people around me. I'm not going to be bittered. I'm not going to be embittered, and I'm not going to have a bad heart about this whole thing. And number three, I'm not going to think about it all the time. Amen? How many of you guys have ever been hurt, and you played that hurt again and again and again, and you just relive that story over and over and over? Can I tell you this? It eats your lunch. It eats you. It eats away at you. It does. So when you've forgiven someone, you made a decision you owe me nothing. I forgive you. And I'm not going to talk about it amongst you or my friends. I'm not even going to think about it. I've forgotten it. You're forgiven. But sometimes something comes up, all of a sudden we revert back to it. Let me give you a story. The story was like this. The author was, uh, he was in his car with his son, and they drove past this restaurant. And as they drove past the restaurant, the son goes, Dad, how come we don't eat there anymore? And immediately out of his mouth, he says, it's because of a certain friend of mine who hurt me so bad, I don't want anything to do with it. That's what, he hurt me in that restaurant. I don't want anything to do with that restaurant, so I'm staying away from it. Whoa, that came out of my mouth. So obviously, he had some issues about it. You know what he had to do? He had to go back to the very first point again. I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. It's a process. So when people say to you, forgive, and then just get on with it, it's a process. And you know what? A process that will go much faster and last much longer if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives in it. Amen? See, this is a spiritual thing. This isn't just uh, psychobabble, uh, psychological stuff. It's not just that. It is a spiritual thing. So when we, when we apply this stuff and we apply the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us when you're a Christian and you put those things together, then the result is so much stronger, so much more powerful. Today, you may be struggling with forg unforgiveness in your heart. Have you... Done, I encourage you to do these two things. Number one, choose to forgive. And then number two, walk it out and how you talk about it. And also number three, invite God. Say, God, I need your help in this matter. Amen? God, I need your help in this matter because I'm flesh and I will fail and I'll mess up and I'll see and I'll get angry again. But God, forgive me, forgive me. And only a Christian can do that. Only those who surrendered their hearts and lives to God can have that power available to them. Otherwise, you just have the power of science and that can only take you so far. But add to it exponentially the power of the Holy Spirit, and it becomes awesome. It becomes awesome. Here's the key. If I fail in the process, then go right back to the crisis. Do that faithfully again and again and again, and God will give you deliverance. God will grant you life. God will grant you blessing. Hallelujah. I hope you enjoyed Pastor Terry's message today. If you would like to have more information concerning our church, you can go to www.faithoutreach.cc. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless.